Hi everyone, it's Professor Primpton. In this video, we're going to start our discussion on average rate of change. So in this section, we're going to take what we learned in the previous chapter with limits and limit properties to start to introduce the concept of a derivative. In this video, we're going to talk about interpreting the meaning of the average rate of change in the context of application problems. And we're also going to understand the connection between the slope of a secant line and average rate of change and that of the slope of the secant line using limits. So in a previous video, we talked about the derivative and how it can be used to solve one of the main problems in calculus, which was called the tangent line problem. So the problem is namely to find the equation of a tangent line to the graph of a function y equals f of x at a point that touches the tangent line and also on the graph. However, we're going to start this video with a review of slope and average rate of change, or just rate of change, that you may have encountered in a college algebra course. So pre-calculus idea, slope and average rate of change, or rate of change, the slope of a line, if you remember from algebra class, it measures how fast a line either rises or falls as you move from left to right along the graph or the line. It measures the rate of change of the y-coordinate with respect to changes in the x-coordinate, or rise divided by run, if you're more familiar with that term. So example, if a line that represents the distance traveled over time is graphed, the slope would represent the velocity. So in the figure below, you can remind yourself how to calculate the slope using two points on a line. So let's label two points on the line. It doesn't matter which two points you choose on the line, you can calculate the slope and it will be the same. So x1 comma y1 will be one point on the line, and x2, y2 will be a different point on the line. So if you take x2, subtract x1, that's called the run, or delta x, if you recognize the symbol delta x. Or it's sometimes called the horizontal change because it tells you how much did the x values change from x1 to x2. And similarly, you also can calculate the difference between the y values. So y2 subtract y1, this distance is called the rise, or delta y, the change in the y values, and it's the vertical change of the graph between the two points. So to calculate slope, slope of a line is represented with lowercase m. It's the ratio between rise divided by run, or vertical change divided by horizontal change. It's the difference between the y values, y2 subtract y1, divided by the difference between the x values, x2 subtract 1. Or you can also have this formula, y1 subtract y2, but then be consistent in the denominator where you have x1 subtract x2. So second point subtract the first point, or the first point subtract the second point. Either way, the same formula will work for finding the slope of the line. And this formula will work as long as the denominator is not zero. In other words, the x values cannot be the same. In that case, if the x values are the same, then you have what's called a vertical line, and the slope is undefined. So what we would like to do is to obtain a same sort of information about how fast a curve rises or falls, even if the graph is not a straight line. So we're going to talk about what's called the average rate of change for a function over a closed interval first. Let's start with the definition of average rate of change. The average rate of change for a function, y equals f of x, starting at a closed interval, x equals a to x equals b, is given as the slope formula. ARC for average rate of change. Notice that the numerator is f of b subtract f of a, so it's the y value at b, subtract the y value at a, so it's y2 minus y1 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you have the x values. It's the x value b minus the x value a, so x2 minus x1 in the denominator. So it's calculating the slope between two points, but we're going to talk about how do you find the slope of a line that connects two points on a curve. And that's called average rate of change. So let's look at this graph. You have a graph of some general curve, y equals f of x. You have two points that's on the curve, a comma f of a, so that's like x1, y1. And you have another point that's b comma f of b, so you have another point that's x2, y2. Say you connect these two points with a line, and this is what's called the secant line that passes through these two points, a comma f of a and b comma f of b. And if you calculate the slope, that's called average rate of change. So slope is the rise divided by run between these two points. It's y2 minus y1, or f of b minus f of a, divided by x2 minus x1, which would be b minus a. So notice that the slope formula is just another way of saying average rate of change. So example one, we're going to find out what's the average cost of production for a commodity. Suppose that the total cost of producing x items is given by the function c of x equals 200 plus 30x minus 0.1x squared. Determine the average rate of change of cost when increasing the production from 25 units to 100 units. So you have a closed interval here. You're starting at 25 units of production and you're going up to 100 units of production. 
how much does it cost you on average to produce an additional item? That's what we're going to find out. So notice that the A is equal to 25 units, that's the starting production level, and B is 100 units, that's the ending production level. You need to find out what are the Y values to calculate the average rate of change. In this case, the average rate of change would be the average cost of production. So here's the formula for your average rate of change. We want to use this in the context of the cost function. So C of B subtracts C of A divided by B minus A. If you plug in the B and the A, it's the cost function at 100 units, subtract the cost at 25 units, and then divide by the difference between the production levels, which is 100 subtract 25. So if you calculate this, C of 100, the cost of producing 100 units will give you $2,200. If you plug in 100 into the function, and if you plug 25 into the cost function, you'll come up with $887.50. So that's the numerator. 2,200 subtract 887 dollars 50 cents is the difference between the cost values and if you want to calculate the difference between the units that's 75 units and if you divide these two you get what's called the average cost or the average rate of change so it's 17 dollars and 50 cents the numerator is talking about the cost in dollars so it's dollars is a numerator per the per is the fraction bar and then items produced so it's very important to talk about the units for average rate of change to give you context for what the answer actually means. Now let's look at this in terms of the graph and actually what we found out with the slope of a secant line. So the previous example informs us the average cost of production increases $17.50 for each unit produced. And that's what we talked about earlier. In terms of the graph, the cost function is a quadratic function. So we know that the graph will be a parabola. C of X was 200 plus 30 X attracts 0.1 X squared. The average rate of change is the slope of the secant line that connects these two points on the graph, which were at 25 units and $887.50 and 100 units and $2,200. All right, let's look at the graph for the cost function. So this graph is a parabola. It y equals c of x for the cost function. We had two points on the graph that we identified. At 25 units of production, the cost was $887.50, so that's this point on the graph. And at 100 units of production, the cost was $2,200. So that's, that's this point. So if you connect these two points with a line, that's called the secant line. And what we did in the previous example was calculate the slope of this line, which was called average cost of production or average rate of change. And we came up with, it was $17.50 per item produced. So that's the slope of this secant line that connects these two points on the curve. So example two, we're going to do something that's very similar for the average rate of change for the revenue this time. So suppose that you have a revenue function for the sale of X items is given as this function, R of X equals 8X subtract 0.01X squared. Again, we're going to determine the average rate of change or rate of change for the revenue function this time when the sales increase from 600 units to 650 units. So notice we have a closed interval. That's very important for average rate of change or slope of the secant line. You have a closed interval where your starting value and you have an ending value for the units in this case. So the starting value is 600 units, and the ending value is 650 units for the value of B. So here's the average rate of change formula. F of B subtract F of A divided by B minus A. The function in this case is the revenue. So average rate of change would be revenue at B subtract the revenue at A divided by B minus A. So if you plug in A and B, you'll come up with revenue at 650 units. So if you plug 650 into the revenue function, you find that it's $975. And if you plug in 600 into the revenue function, the revenue is $1,200. So that's the numerator, 975 subtract 1,200. And then in the denominator, you have the difference between the sales levels, 650 subtract 600, which is 50 units sold. So in the numerator, notice that the revenue is actually decreasing. So you have negative 225, and then divided by 50, you will come up with negative $4.50 per item sold. Okay, so now that we've seen how to calculate the average rate of change in terms of the cost and the revenue functions, we're now going to use the average rate of change in the terms of a falling object. So in the 16th century, Galileo discovered that if you drop a solid object from rest near the surface of the earth and allow it to fall freely, so that means you are ignoring air resistance, the object will fall a distance that is proportional to the square of the time that the object has been falling. So in other words, Galileo came up with a formula that gives you the distance that the object has fallen in terms of how long it has been falling. So if you let D denote the distance that the object has fallen in feet, and T is representing the time that it has fallen in seconds, 
what's called Galileo's law is given as this formula, d equals 16t squared. So we're going to use this formula or this function for the next example. So in the context of the next example, we're going to calculate the average rate of change, which will be called average velocity, and it'll be for a falling tomato. Example three, average velocity of a falling object. Suppose that we drop a tomato from the top of the Arts and Sciences building at Lansing Community College at a height of 100 feet, and we record the time of the tomato's fall. So this person is dropping a tomato off the building, which is 100 feet into the air. The height of the tomato above the ground is given by this function, and it's a variation of the Galileo's law. So the distance that the object has fallen, the tomato, after t seconds is given by the height of the building, subtract, Galileo's law was 16 t squared. So t is the number of seconds after the tomato was released. So part one, how far did the tomato fall during the first second of free fall? So we're going to calculate how far, how well was the distance that the tomato had fallen after one second. So if you plug in one into the function that we were given, 100 subtract 16 times one squared, that means the object is 84 feet above the ground. So the distance that the tomato has fallen is 100 feet, Subtract 84 feet that it is after one second, still above the ground, so the object has fallen 16 feet. Okay, number two, how far did the tomato fall during the last second of free fall? So notice in the figure, it looks like the tomato will hit the ground after 2.5 seconds. So during the last second of free fall would be between 1.5 seconds and 2.5 seconds when it actually hit the ground. So the distance after 1.5 seconds would be 100 minus 16 times 1.5 squared after you plug into the function. The distance above the ground is still 64 feet above the ground after one and a half seconds. And then after two and a half seconds, we know that the distance should be zero above the ground because it actually hit the ground. So if you plug in 2.5, you do get zero feet above the ground. So that means the distance that the object has fallen during that time or traveled during that time is 64 subtract zero or 64 feet. Okay. Number three. What was the average velocity, or in other words, the average rate of change for how much the object has fallen over time during the entire fall? So we're going to start at zero seconds, and we're going to go up to 2.5 seconds. That's the when the object actually hit the ground. So at zero seconds, we were actually 100 feet above the ground. And we know at 2.5 seconds, we already calculated that previously, we were actually zero feet above the ground because the tomato actually hit. So we have a closed interval between 0 and 2.5 seconds. So B is 2.5 and 0 is A. So if you plug that into the average rate of change formula, the distance at 2.5 subtract the distance at 0 seconds divided by 2.5 subtract 0, you come up with the distance at 2.5, it's 0 feet above the ground, subtract the distance above the ground at 0 seconds, which is 100, divided by the time difference, which was 2.5 seconds. So you have negative 100 divided by 2.5, that's negative 40. So again, it's very important to talk about the units for your average rate of change. The numerator was talking about the distance above the ground. That was in feet. And the denominator is talking about the time, which was in seconds. So this is negative 40 feet per second. So that's the average velocity of the tomato over the entire length of the fall between 0 and 2.5 seconds. On average, the tomato was falling 40 feet per second. The answer is negative because the distance is actually decreasing between the ground and the tomato. Part four, what was the average velocity of the tomato between zero and one second? So we're not talking about the entire fall this time, not between zero and 2.5, this time between zero and one second. What was the average velocity or average rate of change? So again, we have a closed interval. We're starting at zero seconds and we're going up to one second. So A is zero and B is one. If you plug zero in, we did this before, you get 100 feet above the ground. If you plug in 1, we did this before, you come up with 84 feet above the ground. So if you plug this information to the average rate of change formula, you come up with d of 1, subtract d of 0. That's the difference between the distances during 0 and 1 second, divided by 1 minus 0. That's, that's the difference in the time between our interval, 0 to 1. The numerator is 84 subtract 100, or negative 16, and the denominator is 1. So in other words, the average velocity of the tomato between zero and one second is negative 16 feet per second. So notice in the last two parts, the tomato is falling at a much slower speed between zero and one second than it did over the entire fall. Part five, what was the average velocity of the tomato between one and two seconds? So again, we're gonna calculate this just like we did in the previous two examples. We have a closed interval. The starting time is at one second. 
The ending time is at 2 seconds, so that's the value of V. You calculate the values for the distance above the ground. So distance after 1 second above the ground is 84 feet. The distance after 2 seconds above the ground, if you plug into the function, you come up with 36 feet above the ground. The average rate of change will calculate the average velocity of the tomato. So D of B minus D of A over B minus A will be D of 2 subtract D of 1 divided by 2 minus 1. So 36 subtract 84 in the numerator, or negative 48, and this is a one second time interval. So the object, or the tomato, is falling negative 48 feet per second between one and two seconds. So comparing this answer with the answer we came up with in part four, it looks like the tomato is actually falling faster on average between one second and two seconds than it was between zero and one second. Part six, how fast was the tomato falling between t equals 1 and t equals 1 plus h seconds, where h is an unknown constant, but it's not 0. So you might be wondering, how does this connect with the last three parts? Well, we're trying to find out how fast the tomato is falling, so that's the average velocity of the tomato, and we also have a closed interval. We have t equals 1 is the starting time, and the ending time is 1 plus h seconds. So a equals 1 and b equals 1 plus h. Now, we don't know what h is, but we know that it's not 0. So if you plug 1 into the function, we did this before, you have 84 feet above the ground. Now, we haven't calculated 1 plus h yet. So if you calculate the function evaluated at 1 plus h, d of 1 plus h would give you 100, subtract 16, it was t, so t is replaced with 1 plus h, in parentheses, that's being squared. Well, if you want to calculate this or simplify, 1 plus h squared is 1 plus h times 1 plus h, so 100 minus 16 times 1 plus h times 1 plus h. So you have to use FOIL to simplify. 1 plus h times 1 plus h will give you 1 plus 2h plus h squared. So now multiply that by 16. So distribute the 16 to all three terms. And then you'll collect like terms. So 100, subtract 16, subtract 32h, subtract 16h squared. 100 minus 16 is 84. And that is the distance above the ground after 1 plus h seconds. So now we're ready to calculate the average velocity or average rate of change. So use the formula. So d of b minus d of a over b minus a. So if you plug in b is 1 plus h, you have the distance at 1 plus h minus the distance at 1 second divided by the difference between the times. 1 plus h subtract 1 in the denominator. So the numerator, plug in what we found out for the y values. We had 84 subtract 32h minus 16h squared. Subtract the other y value, which was 84 feet. The denominator simplifies to just h because 1 subtract 1 is 0. Now collect like terms. Notice you have 84 subtract 84, so that cancels out. All that's left in the numerator are two terms that have h in them. Negative 32h minus 16h squared. The denominator is just h. Notice that the terms in the numerator have h in common, so you can factor it out as a GCF or greatest common factor. So h, pull it out from negative 32h is negative 32. You factor out an h from negative 16 h squared, you have negative 16 h left over. And now notice that the h's will cancel out or simplify. So what's left over is negative 32 minus 16 h. That's the average velocity or average rate of change between 1 second and 1 plus h seconds. So again, the units, the numerator is talking about feet above the ground, so negative 32 minus 16 h feet, and the denominator was in seconds, so per second. And now, part seven, we're going to start tying this in with what we talked about in the previous chapter with limits. Part seven, find the limit of your expression from the previous part as h approaches zero. So in other words, we're going to let this unknown constant approach zero, get really, really small, provided that the limit exists. So we're going to find out the limit as h approaches zero of this average rate of change, or slope of a secant line that we know that we're talking about in terms of a graph. The limit as h approaches zero of distance at 1 plus h minus the distance at 1 second divided by 1 plus h minus 1. We know the 1's will cancel out, so you'll have h in the denominator. We calculated this average velocity or average rate of change. It was negative 32 subtract 16h, so we we'll make that replacement. And so now, notice that this is a polynomial function. Negative 32 minus 16h, you can directly plug in h equals 0 in for the value of h. And so negative 32 minus 16 times 0 will give you negative 32. And this is still average rate of change, so it's feet per second. So it looks like if you're letting this unknown constant h approach zero, 
the limit of the average rate of change or the average velocity, the average velocity will approach negative 32 feet per second. So notice in this last part, the h represents an unknown constant, but h was the difference between the times. It was 1 plus h was the ending time, subtract 1 was the starting time, and we came up with just h. This h represented the difference between the start and the end for this interval that we were talking about in, in part 6. You're talking about shorter and shorter time intervals beginning at t equals 1 second, because we were starting at 1 second because we were starting at one second and we were going up to this unknown one plus h. So if h is approaching zero, we're getting closer and closer to just one second. And we calculated the average rate of change is getting closer and closer to negative 32 feet per second. So this is what's called instantaneous rate of change. We're not talking about a closed interval anymore. We're not talking about one to one plus h. If we let h approach zero, we're getting closer and closer to just one instant in time which was at t equals 1. So this is what's called instantaneous rate of change. The instantaneous rate of change for a function, y equals f of x, at x equals a. So we're not talking about a closed interval. It's only at one particular x value, x equals a. The limit as h approaches 0. Notice that the h in this previous example was talking about the how much time elapsed between 1 and 1 plus h. The denominator was h. And the numerator was talking about the distance that the object had traveled during that time. So the numerator is f of a plus h minus f of a. So you're starting out at x equals a, so that's the f of a, and you're going up to an ending time at x equals a plus h. So this h is an unknown constant, but we're letting this unknown constant get really, really small. So this is what's called the instantaneous rate of change if the limit exists. So example four, average rate of change using a graph. Suppose that we set up a machine that can count the number of bacteria growing on a Petri plate at first, there are a few bacteria, so the population grows very slowly. Then, there are more bacteria to divide. The population will grow very quickly. Later, there are more bacteria and less room and nutrients available for the expanding population, so the population grows slowly again. So you can notice that in the graph. Finally, the bacteria have used up most of the nutrients, and the population declines, and the bacteria die. Use the population of the bacteria graph given below to estimate the answer to the following questions. So let's look at the graph first. Notice that the graph starts at zero days and it goes up to 16, 17, 18 days, or roughly around 18 days. And the population is in thousands, so it goes between zero and it looks like the maximum population of the bacteria on the Petri plate is around 5,000. The population grew very slowly at first, as it said in the problem. Then it hits a peak where the nutrients are not as available to the bacteria and then the population starts to decrease very quickly over time, and then there's no population on the petri plate after about 18 days. Part one, what is the bacteria population at time equals three days? So find t equals three days, trace it up to the graph, and it looks like it's about 0.8 thousand. So 0.8 thousand is about 800 bacteria. So the population of the bacteria using the graph after t equals three days is about 0.8 thousand or 800 bacteria. Part two, what is the population increment between t equals three and t equals 10 days? So it's not talking about the population average rate of change, it's just how much does the population change, the increment? So at t equals three, the population was 0.8 thousand, as we found out from the graph. Now at t equals 10 days, we find 10 on the graph, we trace it up to the graph, and it looks like it's about 4.5 thousand, or 4,500. So how much does the population change? It's 4.5 thousand, subtract 0 0.8 thousand, or 3.7 thousand, 3,700 bacteria between three and 10 days. And now the last part, part three, what is the rate of population growth from t equals three to t equals 10 days? So it's talking about the rate of change in the growth of the bacteria population. So we wanna calculate the average rate of change this time. Average rate of change is the population at the ending time, which is 10 days, subtract the population at the start time, which was three days. So P of 10, subtract P of three, divided by the difference between the time, which was at three days and 10 days. So 10 subtract three. The population at 10 days was 4.5 thousand. The population at three days was 0.8 thousand. So we know that the Y values change at 3.7 thousand. And the time difference was seven days. So 3.7 divided by seven is approximately 0.53 the numerator is thousands of bacteria, so 0.53 thousand bacteria. 
and the denominator is days, so per day. So the average rate of change in the population of the bacteria between t equals 3 and t equals 10 days is about 0.53 thousand per day. So this is a good place to stop our first video on average rate of change. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the slope of a tangent line and the derivative.